The Way into the Holiest series by Derek Prince. Study number eight entitled, Four Chief Requirements of the True Worshipper. We started the tabernacle as a triune building or a triune edifice or construction. The outer court, the holy place, the holy of holies. We've compared this to the nature of man, spirit, soul, and body. Our destination is there. We start here at the outer gate, the east, with its four pillars which we have likened to the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four aspects of Christ's person and nature, the lion, the servant, the man, the eagle, the son of God. The first thing we come to is the great altar of brass with the blood sacrifice, four sides typifying the cross in four aspects. The first side, the forgiveness of past sin. The second side, the dealing with sin as a spiritual power, putting away sin. Third side, the execution of the old man, the death of the rebel. The fourth side, the presentation of ourselves as a burnt offering to the Lord, total surrender. We go on from the brazen altar to the brazen labor, labor which was made of brass taken from the looking glasses of the Israelitish women, typifying the place of the Word of God. First of all, as a mirror showing us our true inner nature, in brass, the means of our judgment of ourselves. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged of God. And the water, the cleansing, sanctifying operation of God's Word. Both are essential. We sum these up, 1 John 5, 6. Jesus came by water, and by blood. Not by water only, but by water and by blood. And it is the Spirit that bears witness. When we come to this area, we have the witness of the Spirit, to the blood shed on the cross, to the water of the Word. Jesus is the Redeemer who died in our place on the cross, shed his blood. He's the teacher who cleanses and sanctifies those whom he has redeemed. Ephesians 5, that he might cleanse and sanctify the church with the washing of water by the Word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. It is very clear that if we are to be in that company which is to be presented to Jesus as a glorious church, we must be cleansed and sanctified with the washing of water by the word. To be redeemed by the blood is essential but not sufficient. We go on from here into the holy place, the first of the two inner areas, through the five pillars which I've likened to the five ministries of Jesus, apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher, which are the ministries that operate within this area. We have the three patterns of the showbread representing the will set out before God, ground, molded, baked, displayed, sanctified, protected, and ordered. That's your will. You could do well to ponder over that. We'll not go into it now. The candlestick, the source of light, your intellect. You must be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The old worldly ways and thoughts must be purged away. The pure oil of the Holy Spirit must come in in his sevenfold manifestation. Being kindled with the fire of dedication, it illuminates your inner being. And when your will and your intellect have been brought into line, you move on to the golden altar of incense which typifies your emotions. They must be purified, controlled, directed, offered up to God in dedication and worship as a sweet favor. And at this point, we come to the dividing line between the holy place of the soul the holy of holies of the spirit, the transition is made by the blood from the sacrifice and the incense from the altar. We go in through the blood of the cross with the incense of adoration, praise, and worship. There is no other way in through the veil. Those that do not know how to worship have no access beyond the holy place. 
We come here where there are two items of furniture, the ark that typifies Christ, the mercy seat that typifies the atonement of Christ, but also the throne of God. In the ark, there were the two tables of stone of the Ten Commandments, the golden pot with manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. The tables of stone typify, typifying God's eternal unchanging law, to which we bow in worship and submission as we enter. The golden pot of manna signifying our fellowship, feeding upon Christ in the heart. He that eateth me shall live by me, Jesus said. Let me point out, which I didn't say, that the three entrances typify the three aspects of Jesus, the way, the truth, and the light. And here he is, the light. Christ is our life. What a wonderful statement that is in Colossians 3. Ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then the part of manna will be taken out of the ark. It won't be the hidden secret communion be the open revelation of Christ. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, be seen, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. The third thing in the ark is the Aaron's rod, type of authority, comes by divine revelation and attestation, setting apart Aaron as the appointed priest. So the three activities of the Spirit in relationship to God in the Holy of Holies are worship, fellowship, and revelation. And revelation comes by the root of worship and fellowship. Be aware of revelation that does not come through worship and fellowship. Then the mercy seat again brings forth the same two truths. On either end of the mercy seat with the two cherubs, or the two cherubim, turned inwards towards each other, their wings extended over the mercy seat, meeting tip to tip in the middle their bowed bodies, their extended wings signifying worship, their faces toward one another and toward the mercy seat signifying fellowship, face to face, encounter. And there is the place of revelation. God said to Moses, when everything has been ordered exactly right from here to here, and when the blood is sprinkled, then I will appear to you over the mercy seat under the wings of the cherubim. The Shekinah glory will come in and there I will speak to you and commune with you. Worship, fellowship, revelation. Now let's look at the four chief requirements. What does God expect of us in availing ourselves of what he's made available? Number one, we better turn back to Hebrews that you see it. It's all in one verse in verse 22 of chapter 10 Hebrews 10 22 let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water what does a true heart mean now I'm offering you my opinion and the words I've taken are words that aren't often used by religious people sincerity honesty loyalty, total commitment, no reservation. That's a true heart. If I love my wife with a true heart, I love her totally. I will not in any circumstance contemplate anything that would be disloyal to her. I think a word we need to restore to religious people's vocabulary is the word loyalty. Loyalty has become square and old-fashioned amongst some people today. Loyalty to your family, loyalty to your country, loyalty to your government. I believe in loyalty. I don't have much time for a person who's disloyal. Charles Simpson and I were discussing this the other day. He said, what was it that made the Apostle John stand in front of the cross when all the other disciples had left by Mary's side? Was it theology? Not for a moment, friends. It was loyalty. What was it that got Mary Magdalene to the tomb in the early hours of the morning? Was that theology? Doctrine? No, loyalty. She was going to be loyal to that man, even if he was nothing but a brutally mutilated corpse. 
there isn't much loyalty amongst some believers. We have to be loyal to Jesus and loyal to one another. And that's a true heart, sincerity, no honey. Remember what I said about honey? You can't put honey on the offerings of the Lord made by fire because it turns into a black, sticky mess. Let's look at some scriptures for a moment. Psalm 51. <laughs> I think people that come to my wife and me for counseling get to know one thing. If you don't want to know what we really think, don't come. <laughs> I believe <laughs> we ought to be honest with one another. Now it says speaking the truth in love, not cutting people down. Psalm 51, verse 6 through 10. Behold, David made a discovery. The word behold is dramatic. He'd been religious a long while. Now he made a discovery. Thou desirest truth in the inward path. And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. I believe they go together. You don't know the hidden wisdom till you have truth in the inward part. The revelation of the hidden wisdom is to the sincere, true, honest heart, not to the mind. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. To me, that's a revelation. When sin has had its way in your heart, it can't be patched up, repaired, or modified. It takes a creative act of God to give you a clean heart. And that's what every one of us needs, a clean heart. Truth in the inward part, sincerity, honesty, Say with your mouth what you have in your heart. Psalm 139. That, <laughs> that means you've got to have the right thing in your heart. Otherwise it's going to be embarrassing. The last two verses of Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. David is talking about God's enemies. I have to go into the previous two verses to get the context. Do not I hate them, O Lord, which hate thee. Am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them as enemies. I ask people, is it right for a Christian to say that? Some people say yes, some people say no. I say, look in the next verse and see where David was looking for God's enemies. Search me, O Lord. Do I have a fifth column inside me? Is there something inside me that's an enemy of God? I tell people in deliverance, God will not deliver you from your friends. You make your friends your enemies and God will get them out. A young man said to me once, he said, Brother Prince, I think I have a demon of lust. But he said, I'd rather enjoy it. Do you think God will deliver me? I said, definitely not. Why should he take your friends out of you? But when you make them your enemies, then God will move. So David, he wasn't talking about other people. He said, search me, O God. See if there's something inside me that's on the wrong side that's opposed to you. I hate anything that's against God. Can you say that? Can you really say it? You have to take signs. There's no neutrality. All right, we read these verses now. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Do you invite God to do that? Are you afraid to do that? Don't be afraid. I tell people when it comes to confession, remember, you're not going to confess anything God doesn't know already. You not tell him anything that will surprise him. It's for your sake, not his. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I do believe before God can lead us in this way, which is the everlasting way, we have to let him search and try our hearts. Root out any fifth column. Any of God's enemies lurking there. Lay bare our heart. Jeremiah 17. You say, Brother Prince, there's nothing wrong with my heart. I'm all right. I say, how do you know? There's only one person that can see into your heart, and that's not you. Jeremiah 17, 9. And the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Not Brother Prince's heart. 
but the heart, the human heart, your heart, my heart, deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. In 1946, I sat in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, listened to the greatest expert on the Hebrew language lecture, and he chose that passage because of one word, the word that's translated deceitful, akob, which is the same word that gives us the name Jacob, Yaakov, because Jacob was a supplanter. He was a, a tricky fellow. And oh, how that word opened up to me. It's found in Isaiah 40, Make the crooked place straight. It's found in Hosea 6, I believe, where it says, Gilead is a city polluted with blood. That's the same word. And what this professor said, he said one thing. He said, because of the way the feminine of the adjective is formed, we know it's not passive, it's active. Your heart is actively deceitful. So don't ask it for the truth. He said, <laughs> it's like a shield in front of your heart. You take away one shield, and you find another shield. You take away that shield, and there's another. And he said, you never know when you've taken the last shield away. It was remarkable, because though he was professing Jew, he wasn't religious, he didn't make any profession of faith, whatever. But simply by the exposition of that word, he lay bare to me something that I've never forgotten. The heart is deceitful above all things. The most deceitful thing in the world is the human heart. And furthermore, it's incurably sick. Desperately wicked, better translated incurably sick. And elsewhere, Jeremiah says, thou hast no healing medicine. You don't have any medicine to heal your heart. Who can know it? First hand, I, the Lord, search the heart. Let God show you what's in your heart. And then let him deal with it. Lay it bare to him. Say, search me, O God. Try my heart. I'm not afraid to say that. I don't believe I could be more embarrassed than I have been. I was talking to Brother Mumford after the deliverance service. I said, some people are surprised when they see a young man who's been used of God to bring thousands of people to the Lord, writhing on the floor, twisting doesn't surprise me the least. Almost everything I've cast out of other people, I got rid of myself first. And I was a Pentecostal preacher at that time, let me tell you. Doesn't fit in with your theology, you just have to change your theology. <laughs> people say, a Christian can't have demons. You ever heard anybody say that? Well, let me tell you a little parable, and I won't even bother to interpret it. But I lived for five years in East Africa and traveled several times between Kenya and Tanzania, which was then Tanganyika. And just in the northern end of Tanganyika, or Tanzania, is the most beautiful mountain, Kilimanjaro, which is snow-capped. I wonder if any of you have ever seen Kilimanjaro. It's the most beautiful sight. See the rays of the tropical sun glittering off that snow-capped mountain. Well, the first missionary to East Africa was a German named Krapf. Wandered around, incidentally, in a rather disarming way, with no weapon but an umbrella, <laughs> which he carried to shelter himself from the rain and the heat and slept under at night. And uh, he discovered Kilimanjaro, reported in his journals that there was a snow-covered mountain just a few miles south of the equator. When the journals reached Britain, some expert wrote a book to prove that there couldn't be a snow-covered mountain that close to the equator. <laughs> now you see the application. <laughs> All right, Isaiah 29, verses 13 and 14. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. That's religion. Honors God with the lips, but its heart is far from me. And it's all what people say I should do. 
fear taught by the precept of men. And if you're a Mennonite, you act one way. And if you're assemblers of God, you act another way. And if you're Catholic, you act a third way. But for many people, whether they're Catholic, Assembly of God, or Mennonite, it's a religious act. That's all it is. It shouldn't be necessary for you to change your whole way of behavior when you walk through the doors of the church. You find most religious people use even a different tone of voice inside the church. When they pray, it's in an artificial, false voice. The great sin of religious people was the one that Jesus dealt with most severely in the Pharisees, hypocrisy. And you know what hypocrisy is? It's the Greek word for an actor. Hypocrites is the Greek for an actor. And religion is essentially putting on an act. Depends what kind of religion you belong to, what kind of act you put on. Under uh, ancient culture, for drama, there were certain marks, I think about five or six. And every playwright had to write a play with that number of characters for that number of marks. And an actor, when he played his part, he didn't show his real face, he put on the mask. And that's exactly like religion. It's just a selection of masks. Which mask will you have? The Catholic mask? The Assemblies of God mask? The Methodist mask? And that's how you act while you're in church. And while you're saying all those nice things to God with your lips, your heart is far from Him. And God says, when people are like that, I'll judge them. I'll take away from the ability to see truth. I'm amazed at some people that can't see truth today. I could name groups, but I won't. And I understand the root cause is hypocrisy. And God removes from the hypocrite the ability to see the truth. Let me show you that. I'll read Isaiah 29, 13 and 14 again. For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips to honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Don't drink, don't dance, don't smoke, don't go to the movies. That's the group I belonged to for years. But when the TV came out, it wasn't covered by all those precepts. <laughs> so, it was wrong to go outside the home to see the murder thriller or the cowboys, but it was all right to get it inside your home on the TV screen. Well, to me, that's nothing but plain hypocrisy. If it's bad outside, it's twice as bad inside. Is that right? No, I, I was guilty of that myself. I lived under those rules for much longer than I can to think. But believe me, friends, I never intend to get back under a set of rules like that. Not even charismatic rules, either. Do you know what some people have done? They've thrown out the Baptist rules and replaced them with charismatic rules. And charismatic rules are just as soul-destroying as Baptist rules or Catholic rules or any other rule. All right, we come to the point. Verse 14. Therefore, behold, because of this hypocrisy, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, the people of God. Even a marvelous work and a wonder. The language is as strong as God can make it. Something astonishing. The wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Have you known religious groups like that? I have. And I'm not thinking of the Roman Catholics, let me hasten to say. You know what I'm thinking about, to tell you the truth? <laughs> the Pentecostals. Every religious group that's really had a message has added a story to God's building, the church. But almost invariably, the next thing they've done is put the roof on. So that's it. No more. <laughs> and next time the wind of the Holy Spirit blows, you know the first thing it does? Blows the roof off. <laughs> and you know the people who oppose most bitterly the building of the next story on top of theirs? The ones who built the previous story. Isn't that remarkable? I can understand it now, but a long while I couldn't understand. The people that spearheaded the last revival are the opponents of this one. Astonishing. Well, we must go on. Coming back to a true heart, no hypocrisy. 
no religious acts, sincerity, loyalty. Brother Baxter said, translate faith by obedience, and that's tremendous thought. Let me offer you another aspect of it. Translate faith by loyalty. Loyalty to Jesus Christ at any cost. You find they work exactly to the same end. All right, fullness of faith. This is the next condition. Where it says full assurance of faith, I think the better translation is fullness of faith. How do you have fullness of faith? Is it an effort? Is it a struggle? Do you have to pinch yourself and am I full of faith? No. It's a decision. Faith is a decision. That's why unbelief is the primary sin. What is it to have fullness of faith? Let me suggest to you Psalm 119, verse 128. There are many different ways you could present this. Psalm 119, verse 128. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, that's dressed to the Lord, and I hate every false way. Oh, how much that says. God, whatever you say is right, and anything that disagrees with you is a false way. Now that's not a feeling, that's a decision. You can make that decision when you will. The outworking of it may take many, many years, but the decision can be made in a moment. I intend to agree with what God says. Whatever he says is right, that's what I came to. When I was saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit in an army barrack room, not knowing anything about New Testament doctrine, I clutched hold of one fact. The Bible is the book with the answer. It's the one that tells me what happened to me. And I made up my mind then, at that time, whatever the Bible says is right, and anything or anyone that disagrees with the Bible is wrong. That's it. Psalm 119, verse 128. It's simple. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things. To be right, are you afraid to say that? Shall we say it together? Don't say it if you don't want to be taken up on it, because you will. And so may I. Uh, if you've got Psalm 119, verse 128 in front of you, we'll read it together, all right? If you've got another version, it'll come out just as well. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? It's the same decision again. All right, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Intellectual difficulties are basically an unwillingness to make a decision. It's procrastination and indecision in the spiritual realm. Because believing is a decision. Sometime or other you've got to make the decision. If you wait till you understand the whole Bible before you believe it, you'll wait a long while. Isn't that right? If you wait to understand everything about Jesus Christ before you accept him, you'll wait a long while. Faith is a decision in relation to Christ and the Scripture. I've made that decision. Thank God my mind is at rest. I have perfect inward peace. All right. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You can do that. Inside you is a mind trained to argue with God. Shut it up. By nature, it's opposed to God. Look, keep your finger there and turn to Romans 8, 7. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Suppress that enemy. Refuse to give him liberty to speak. When you say, do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee. That's your carnal mind. It's an enmity with God. Don't listen to it. Don't let it argue. Don't let it come out with its butts. You've decided everything God says is right. Stick to that decision. That's the fullness of faith. James 1, verses 6 through 8. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. What's wavering in modern English? Indecision. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. That's a very sweeping statement, isn't it? 
the double-minded, unstable, undecided person gets nowhere with God. So make your mind up. From now on, what God says is right. That's the fullness of faith. And I must give you what the Lord gave me before the meeting. 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 through 12. You should look at the background of this. It's very important. 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That should take your breath away if you're not familiar with that scripture. God will send people strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. It's that simple. If you don't believe the truth, you will believe a lie. Now which are you going to believe? That was Eve's choice. God told her the truth. Satan told her a lie. She had two things. She chose the lie. That's unbelief. What is unbelief? It's believing the lie. It's not believing nothing. Everybody believes something. It's a decision. Will I believe God or will I believe the serpent? And God says, if you don't believe the truth, he'll see to it. God will see to it that you believe the lie. So you better believe the truth. You charismatics, don't fool around with the truth. Don't believe just as much as suits you and leave the rest. Don't be like Saul, King Saul, said, Blessed be the Lord God, I've obeyed the commandment of the Lord. He did as much as suited him and lost his crown for it. I taught that story in Africa to my students, my African students, and I was going to teach them the spiritual truth, which was the pattern we gave them. And I can see this scene so vividly in a classroom right there in East Africa, walking to the blackboard to write up the spiritual truth of the story about King Saul. You know the story I'm talking about. He was sent to slay the Amalekites and came back bearing Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen. And uh, he said to Samuel, I've obeyed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, I don't understand that. I can hear sheep bleating and oxen lowing. If they were dead, how could they be doing that? So I was teaching my students this, and I said, I'll tell you the spiritual truth of this story. And as I walked to the blackboard, it was as though God said to me, I'll tell you the spiritual truth of this story. And by the time I got to the blackboard, I had it. And I wrote it up. Incomplete obedience is disobedience. Just believing as much as you want to believe is believing nothing. It's unbelief. You can receive the love of the truth, or you can come under delusion. That's the only two options available to God's people as this age closes. All right, we're going on to a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. Romans 5, 9. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. But it says we're justified by the blood of Jesus. You know my definition of justified? Just as if I'd never sinned. That's right. That's how righteous the blood of Jesus makes. There's no more conscience of sin. Romans 8, 1, There is thou for now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 3, 21, If our heart condemn us not, then have we boldness toward God. But if I'm condemned in my heart, I have no access to God. Psalm 66, 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And that's a faith stand you have to take. All my sins are forgiven. I've confessed them all. God has forgiven them all. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses me from all unrighteousness. I am justified just as if I'd never sinned. Do you believe that? I do. I really believe it. I don't let my mind insinuate religious doubts. I believe it exactly the way it's sin. I've confessed all my sins. I can think of no sin that I haven't confessed. I believe God is faithful and just. I believe he's forgiven me all my sins. I believe he's cleansed me from all unrighteousness. I believe I'm accepted in the beloved. I believe I'm justified just as if I'd never sinned. And I don't have to cringe in the presence of God. I don't have to whimper. I have to walk in upright. 
Leviticus 26.13 says, I have made you to go upright. In Egypt, they bowed under heavy burdens. They cringed under the taskmaster's whip. But when God redeemed them by the blood of the Lamb, he said, the burdens have been taken away. You don't need to cringe beneath the whip. Walk upright. And I say every child of God has got the right to walk down the straight and narrow pathway of the will of God with his eyes straight ahead saying, Satan, stand aside. There's a child of God coming on the road and you get out of my way. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 17, it goes even better than that. And their sins and iniquities, God says, I will remember no more. I say God hasn't got a bad memory. He's got a good forgetter a lot of difference. God remembers everything that he doesn't decide to forget. But if he decides to forget it, he doesn't remember it anymore. All right. The last one is a body washed with pure water. Hebrews 10, 22. Are you with me there? Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You mean to say the condition of my body affects my access to God? Yes, it does. Does it mean my body? It means your body. I believe it does. All right, what does it mean to have your body washed with pure water? Well, what's the pure water? The Word of God. How does God's Word purify us? 1 Peter 1, 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. How does God's Word purify you? When you do what? Obey it, that's right. Through the Spirit, the Word ministered by the Spirit and obeyed purifies you. 1 John 3, 3, what does that say? Every man that hath this hope in him, Jesus Christ, purifieth himself even as he is pure. Do you know how to purify yourself? Obey the Word ministered to you through the Spirit and you purify yourself. How pure have you got to be? even as he is pure. That's only one standard that God has, it's Jesus. All right, 1 Thessalonians 4, this very much relates to water baptism, let me tell you that. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 and 4. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should be holy, that ye should abstain from fornication. Fornication is unholy. The abuse of your body for immoral sex purposes is unholiness. Verse 4, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification, in holiness and honor. What's your vessel? Your body is the vessel. And the Bible says it's the will of God that you should know how to keep that vessel unsullied, pure and holy. And then it goes on in 1 Thessalonians 5:23. The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord. I'd like to give you an assignment for homework. Come back to the next conference and tell me what it means to have your body preserved blameless. Please put in some study on that one. Come back and share it with me. The Bible says that your body could and should be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord. And that's complete holiness. If your body is not preserved blameless, whatever that may mean, it's not total holiness. The will of God is that you should know how to possess this vessel in sanctification and honor. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 through 20. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 12 through 20. The main theme here is the importance of the body. See, most Christians grow up with the attitude the body isn't really important. The Bible never says that. Please know, it's not scriptural to belittle your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, all things are lawful unto me. It's all right for me to eat free ice cream Sundays. Ah, but have you read us the next verse? All things are not expedient. It doesn't do me good. <laughs> All things were lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. No ice cream or cigarette or cup of coffee. 
is going to dictate to me. I heard Brother Lester Summerall say, the morning I wake up and feel I can't do without a cup of coffee is the morning I won't drink it. And that's a pretty good decision to make. When you become dependent on anything, you're enslaved by it. All things are lawful, but I will not be brought under the power of any of them. Verse 13, food for the stomach, and the stomach for food. That's the Prince version. But God is going to put away both of them. They're not permanent. Enjoy them while you have them, but it's not going to be for long. Now, the body is not for fornication. That's easy for any Christian to say amen to, but what about the next part of this? But for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. Who's your body for? The Lord. And when your body is for the Lord, the Lord is for your body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know you not that your bodies are the members of Christ. Christ's members on earth are our physical members. That's all he has to work through. Shall I take the members of Christ and make them the members of a prostitute? God forbid. Know you not that he which is joined to the prostitute is one body. For two saith he shall be one flesh. But he that clings and cleaves to the Lord is one spirit. And you'll see that it's an exact parallel the physical relation of the prostitute, the spiritual relationship to the Lord. It's a union with the Lord. He that is united in that love relationship with the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Their sex sins defile your physical body. And that I believe to be absolutely true. Verse 19, what know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. You don't belong to yourself, and that includes your body. It's God's property. For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, because both of them are God. That makes a great deal of difference. What's the supreme purpose of your body? To serve as a temple for what? The Holy Spirit. That's right. See, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. You can build him the nicest church or cathedral, and he may come there when his people are there. But his dwelling place is the physical body of the redeemed believer. Matthew 28, 19. Isn't that something? Did you ever see that in this context? Go ye and make disciples of all nations. And what do you do after that? baptizing them, immersing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The first thing that happens to your body after you commit your life to Jesus Christ is it is entirely submerged in water. It's totally set apart. There's a cleansing, sanctifying application of water. See, every sacrifice in the Old Covenant its inwards were washed with water. Everything that's offered to God on the altar of blood must then be washed in the water. This is a sanctifying, separating ordinance. And it's not unimportant that every single external area of your body comes under that washing. It's not to make you physically clean, but it is to make you holy in the true sense of set apart to God. And you have omitted a basic provision for holiness without that. Repent and do what? Be baptized. How many of you? Every one of you. When you've done that, then Romans 12, 1. Romans chapter 12, Verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God. And Matthew 23, 19 says, it's the altar that sanctifies the gift. So your body is sanctified when it's placed on God's altar. That's how to preserve your body in sanctification and honor. Keep it on the altar. Jesus said to the Pharisees, how foolish can you be? It isn't the gift that sanctifies the altar. It's the altar that sanctifies the gift. 
you place your body on God's altar, as long as it is in contact with the altar, it is sanctified. But if you break the contact, you lose your sanctification. It doesn't belong to you, it belongs to God. Romans 6, 12 and 13. Let not sin therefore reign where in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. It means your physical members. Don't yield them to sin. But yield yourselves unto God and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. What do you do? You have your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. You know your sins are forgiven. You know your heart is cleansed. And then you have your body washed with pure water the pure water of the Word of God. You purify it by obeying the truth ministered to you by the Holy Spirit. The first purifying act after believing is being immersed, passing through the water, being set apart to God. After that, you lay that sanctified body that's sanctified by blood and by water on the altar of God's service. And you present every individual member to God as an instrument. And your body thereafter is a vessel and it's an instrument. And it's the only instrument that Jesus Christ has to do his will in this world at this time. Our members are the members of Christ. Let's bow in prayer. Time is passing, but I want to give an opportunity to those here this afternoon who are not sanctified in this sense of obeying the truth of God's word. And I want those of you that do not know your sins are forgiven to be included. If you want to accept the forgiveness and cleansing of your sins in the blood of Jesus. I want those of you that have accepted the cleansing of sin but never immersed your body in pure water to present it to God. If you will do that, Remarkably enough, the next item on the agenda is the baptismal service. All right, God planned it that way for you. And then I want those that have done those two things but never presented their bodies to God. You really aren't clear about the ownership of your body. And you never will be clear till you present it to God because God isn't going to take it till you give it. I want those to present their bodies to God. Have I made it clear? You can do all three this afternoon. Those that don't know their sins are forgiven. They don't have their hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Something's still troubling your conscience. Those that have been sprinkled in the blood but never washed in the pure water of baptism. I want you to come. And then I want those that have been both sprinkled and washed but never presented their bodies and their members. If you want to do that, you can do it this afternoon. Shall we bow in prayer with our eyes closed in reverence about 30 seconds while you weigh up what I've been telling you this afternoon. And then if you want to act and make this decision and commitment, I want you to stand to your feet and walk out here to the front. That'll be the last part of this service, to stand to your feet. Walk out here. You say, I want to be sure all my sins are forgiven. Or I want to... Tell God that I'm going to be immersed or I'm going to present to God my body as a temple for the Holy Spirit, my members as instruments. I'm going to know from this afternoon onwards my body is for the Lord, the Lord for my body. Now any of those needs that you recognize, will you stand to your feet right now and move out to the front and then it's between you and God. I don't want to interview you nor counsel with you. I want you to make your commitment. For more great teaching from Derek Prince, tune in to Derek Prince Legacy Radio on a station in your area. Or you can listen online anytime at DerekPrince.org.